I'm Dr. Salil Kandwala, and I'm the medical director at Advanced Urogynecology of Michigan. Our practice mainly takes care of women with pelvic floor dysfunction, and it is a, a subspecialty in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. A lot of information about our practice and the different medical conditions that we take care of is available on our website, which is as stated here, www.augm.org. Today, we shall discuss what is genitourinary syndrome of menopause, or GSM. Menopause typically happens around the age of 51, and meno is menses, pauses is Latin word for cessation. So classically, uh, literally, it means cessation of menses, that is when a woman stops having her period typically happens around the age of 51. It could happen earlier in certain cases, such as women who are smokers have had a hysterectomy. Even if the ovaries are left behind, they may still go through an early menopause. A family history of early menopause in a sibling or in the mother. And of course, there's something called surgical menopause versus natural menopause. Natural menopause is when a woman still has her ovaries and she goes through the change of life. Surgical menopause is when the ovaries are removed and obviously, therefore, the hormone levels will start dropping down. The change, however, the change and when the women, a woman starts feeling the symptoms could happen right from the 40s, even though she's having her regular periods. And this period of time is called climacterium. And that could start in the 40s when the woman starts noticing that she's having some dryness and um, hot flashes and night sweats, and it can go all the way into the 60s. So this is a typical female anatomy. You've got the uterus in the front, which is bending forward. Then you've got the two tubes on each side. And these are the fimbria or the finger-like projections of the tubes. And we've got the two ovaries, one ovaries here and one ovaries here. So as the ovarian blood, blood supply changes and the ovarian function decreases, these ovaries from an almond shape literally become as though someone just drew a white line on the sidewall, becomes extremely thinned out. So genitourinary syndrome of menopause, essentially it's genito and urinary symptoms. The genital or the vaginal symptoms essentially are those of vaginal dryness, burning, irritation. Now, this could be just spontaneous, so a woman just feels that dryness, irritation, and itching, or it could be induced at the time of sexual intercourse. So when the partner is going in due to the lack of lubrication, there is discomfort during intercourse. Sometimes there is bleeding and irritation and ongoing discomfort, not just during intercourse, but even after intercourse. This in turn leads to pelvic muscle spasm and obviously if there is going to be pain, there is not going to be any desire to have intercourse and therefore the libido goes down. That's the genital symptoms. The urinary symptoms are associated with urgency, frequency to go to the bathroom, burning, and history of recurrent urinary tract infections. And we'll review all these symptoms. So the previous terminal, terminologies that we used for this condition was known as vulvovaginal atrophy or atrophic vaginitis. The problems with this previous terminologies is that they only address the vagina, not the bladder symptoms. And there is really no itis. It's no infection of the vagina. So whenever anybody says vaginitis or vulvitis, you think, oh my God, there is a bad infection and I need to be on an antibiotic. It is just slight inflammation, not a true infection. And to talk about this is not comfortable to use in social discussions in the media. And that's why we've come up with this terminology called the genitourinary syndrome of menopause or GSM. So now let's look at a few statistics and few studies that have been done that have looked at the prevalence. So this is really an eye opener. So I'm going to, I'll go over a few with you. This is the Italian Agata study, which was done in 913 women aged around 59 plus minus seven years. Vulvovaginal atrophy was noted in 65 to 85% of women. Vaginal dryness was noted in 100%, followed by pain during intercourse, burning, itching, and dysuria, that is, uh, discomfort during urination. Pain during sex as the reason for avoiding sexual intercourse 
was noted in over 50% of women and in fact by 61% of men. So it's not only about the women, but even the men are affected uh, by the female pelvic floor changes. The REVIVE study, which is the Real Women's Views of Treatment Options for Menopausal Vaginal Changes, it, there was a survey done in over 3,000 postmenopausal women in the United States. Vaginal dryness was noted in over 50%, dyspareunia, that is pain during intercourse, in almost about 50%, and vaginal irritation in about a third. This also, the changes affected enjoyment of sex in over half of the women and vaginal symptoms negatively affected enjoyment of sexual activity, sleep, and overall enjoyment of life. The CLOSER survey, which is the Clarifying Vaginal Atrophy's Impact on Sex and Relationships, was to better understand the impact of this vulvovaginal atrophy or GSM in the context of the couple, not just the woman itself, but also the couple. Vaginal discomfort had a direct negative impact on the intimacy of both partners, women in about 58%, look at men, 78%. Loss of libido, that means not desiring intercourse, was noted in 64% of women and 52% of men. So this is a very important study, the CLOSER study, which shows that GSM has an impact not just on the woman. So it's not that only the female partner will not want to have intercourse, whereas the male partner absolutely has no problems having intercourse. It affects both the partners and therefore the couple as a whole. So the CLOSER survey showed that 38% of women and 39% of the male partners reported that vaginal symptoms had a worse than expected impact on their intimate relationships. Then we looked at the VIVA study, which is the Vaginal Health Insights, Views and Attitudes. There's an international survey which was done in over 3,500 women who are postmenopausal between the age of 55 and 65 in Europe and the United States. 80% of women with genital atrophy considered its impact on their lives to be negative. 75% reported negative consequences in the sexual life. 70% reported that it made them feel less sexual. 33% reported negative effect on their marriage and relationships. And 25% reported a negative impact on their own self-esteem. So what is the impact? As you can see, it affects more than 50% of postmenopausal women. It affects not just the woman, but also her male partner. And it affects not only the physical well-being, but also the mental well-being and negatively impacts one's self-esteem and marital relationship. The US VIVA study showed that almost 50% of women with symptoms of GSM, however, did not consult a healthcare provider. So this is the concern that we have. Both women and the healthcare providers do not feel comfortable talking about this condition. Isn't it sad that of course the woman is suffering and she should be bringing it up, but what is even worse is that the healthcare providers themselves do not feel comfortable talking about this. So if a woman comes to my office and I'm a gynecologist and I don't feel like bringing up, I'm, I'm as though embarrassed to bring up the topic of are you having pain during intercourse or discomfort? And that absolutely makes no sense. So I think it is important for both the patient or the woman herself and her partner to be aware of what can be done, that this is a natural and a normal consequence of aging. And the second is that the doctor should bring this up because if the doctor does not bring it up, you know, then the woman does not feel the confidence to talk about it. However, now that you know about this and you learn a lot more about this as I, as I go on, you will absolutely want to talk about this and bring this up with your physician or if you come here with us. So what happens is, why does it happen? So you know, typically the hormones going on, the estrogen and the progesterone are cycling before the menopause, but once menopause hits, the two hormones starts going down, down, down. So if you see an estrogen, it's almost in de decline. And by mid fifties, essentially going away completely. But you look at what happens to the vagina itself. So this is the vaginal lining. So as you've taken a sample of the vaginal uh, lining or the epithelium, and we're looking under the microscope. 
So what you can see here is this part is the lining or the squamous epithelium. So this area is nice keratin and it's nicely thickened lining with a lot of nuclei and you have what is called a papillae that, are, that is going into uh, the, the area below the epithelium. And you can see that below the epithelium in the subepithelium, there is good collagen and it looks nice and red and good blood vessels. This very thick layer, by the way, this layer here, look where it becomes. Tiny layer after menopause. Once estrogen disappears, this multinuclei, so these are many, many, many nuclei, what's called a multinucleated layer becomes very thin. There is no evidence of any secretions on the outside. Look at this nice, which is what we call turgid. Turgid, that means high vascularity, high fluid, high elasticity. It's replaced by low elasticity, low vascularity, low water content, and almost inelastic fibrous-like tissue. So those are the changes that happen at a microscopic level, and these microscopic changes cause the symptoms that we know about. Anatomically, what are the changes? So this is a female anatomy you're looking at. This is the mons pubis, the pubic hair would be here. This is the clitoris, the urethra, the vagina, and this is the vaginal thin lip called the labia minora, and this is the labia majora or the labial thick lip. And then you have the perineum and the anus. So this is a typical female anatomy, what's now called the vaginal opening or the vaginal introitus. So what you see is that certain changes happen where the urethra is now prolapsing. So the labia, which I showed you, the thick lips have thinned out completely. The clitoris, the hood retracts, and you can see the prepuce of the clitoris. There is intense redness of the vagina. And look at the vaginal wall. The folds, the classic rugosity of the vagina flattens out, and you can see it's basically flat, and it becomes inelastic. The opening is patchulous and it causes not only the dryness, but also discomfort. At the tip, you can see there's a little bit of fluid, and that is more from the vaginitis or the inflammation that is producing the fluid. So there's atrophy, atrophic vaginitis or inflammation of the vagina, flattening of the vagina folds, flattening of the labial folds, prolapse of the urethra, and the clitoris gets exposed. So all those changes happen when you see the um, uh, problem with menopause. So we talked about some of the symptoms such as the uh, frequency, the urgency. We talked about the vaginal symptoms of dryness, discomfort, irritation, itching, and also pain during it, of course. Now, how do you get the urinary tract infections in a menopausal woman? So this is again due to the lack of estrogen. So what happens is, now remember where I told you the thickened, nice lining, and it releases the, the cells when they open up and break down, the glycogen is released, and that, that gets converted to something called lactic acid. So when there's lactic acid, the vaginal pH is low. Once that glycogen goes away, there is no lactic acid, the vaginal pH becomes high. Now, let us see what happened. These guys are the E. coli, the bugs that are hanging around. Now, typically, when there's estrogen in the vagina, the uh, pH of the rectum is 7. So, these bugs are okay, and that's why they're called E. coli. Or E. coli is a classic bug that causes bladder infection. Coli, that means in the colon. So, they're happily being in the colon, and we are okay with that. They do not cross forward. Why? Because remember that lactic acid in the vagina, it drops the vaginal pH down to an acidic pH of four to four and a half. Same thing in the urethra, and that is why the bacteria cannot move up. However, once menopause sets in, then the pH of the vagina and the urethra become the same as the rectum. Because remember I told you the vaginal pH goes up once there is no lactic acid. Now these guys can go around the rectum, at the perineum, in the vagina, at the opening of the urethra, and can get pushed into the bladder. And that is bad news. Why? Because once they get into the, into the bladder, they will flourish and cause a bladder infection. So lack of estrogen after menopause causes the pH changes. And because of these pH changes, you have the bacteria growing in the bladder, causing a urinary tract infection. 
Now, when we talk about management, let me tell you one very, very important thing. Remember, menopause is a new event. It's an event of the 19th century onwards. So it's very, just about 200 years old. Why does it happen? Because today, a woman is typically living into her mid 80s, if not her 90s, and that is going to keep increasing. Menopause happens at 50. So almost more than a third of a woman's life is lived in the postmenopausal years, something which can progressively see changes. So when there is lack of estrogen, this is the problem. It's a progressive changing vagina. So the elasticity going down, the redness increasing, the dryness getting worse, the pelvic muscles going in a spasm, all those things are worsening over time and gradually getting to the point where even the labial lips sometimes stick to each other and closes off the vagina completely. And that's called labial adhesions because they become so irritated that they stick to each other. So what is important is that it's a progressive condition, worsening sexual dysfunction and urogynic and, and urogynecological cons, uh, consequences such as urgency and frequency, bladder infections, tight pelvic floor. Over time, if left untreated, as I mentioned, it can cause significant, significant vaginal narrowing to the point that the vagina may completely close off. The most important thing about treatment, the most important thing is not just to start the treatment early early is the key word here but also to maintain it throughout her life so it's not just about giving the treatment and then stopping it but giving the treatment and continuing the treatment ongoingly so what are the goals of our treatment one the most important goal is to educate women right from the 30s to the 40s it is important to tell a woman who comes in for an annual examination that listen Menopause is going to happen around 50 and you should be prepared for that. So what if the hormones cease? We have ways around it and a lot can be done to help you to maintain a normal life, a normal sexual life and avoid some of those bladder symptoms. It is important for us as healthcare providers to openly discuss this with you so that you can feel free to bring it up. If I don't feel comfortable talking to you, how are you going to be comfortable asking me about what can be done about it. So we need to encourage women to talk about it right from their 40s and make the patient aware that there are these different options available for you. It's not only about the patient, but also involve her sexual partner in discussion that the, and so that the couple, both together, they feel comfortable to discuss this and they don't feel that this is something wrong that they're doing or they should be guilty about. So the we should constantly encourage patients to talk about it and impress upon the patient that this is a progressive condition. So right now it may not be too bad, but over time it can get worse and we do not want to wait too long until the changes are hard to correct. It's always good to start early and most importantly, continue with the treatment and so that the changes are preserved and the bad changes don't happen. And of course, we have to talk to the patient and see what she would herself want to do. So the what is the main gold standard? The gold standard of treatment is estrogen. It's the mainstay. If it is just vaginal symptoms only, such as the GSM, then it is applied only topically, which is in the vagina. If the patient also has hot flashes and night sweats, then we give it vaginally and orally. It is very effective in improving the epithelium, improving the vaginal pH, making it acidic, and reversing the vulvar changes that I mentioned of the atrophy. It comes in different, different types. The best is for GSM, the best is vaginal or inside the vagina or vulvar estrogen, not taking a tablet. It's good to take it in as a cream or a vaginal tablet or a vaginal ring. The different, different preparations which are, which are available that a woman can use. They're very similar in how they work and depends upon the patient's choice. When should it not be given is if the patient has undiagnosed bleeding, history of breast cancer in herself or a, or a strong history of family, strong family history of breast cancer. If she has uterine cancer or ovarian cancer, which is estrogen dependent, history of blood clots or lung clot 
and any other clot, whether it could be in the blood and, and the arteries and severe liver dysfunction. So that's what led to the black box warning because of this uh, breast cancer information. How long should estrogen be continued? It's a very common question I'm asked. You know, there is really no limit. You know, the most studies that have been done have documented safety only up to 12 months and they haven't followed those patients beyond. But that doesn't mean that at the end of 12 months, we'll have problems with the estrogen. It has just not been studied beyond that in a formal manner. The WHI, which is the Women's Health Initiative Study findings, showed that when they were taking estrogen and progestin, women had increased incidence of breast cancer, higher incidence of strokes and heart disease, and that led to the FDA black box warning against estrogen. However, this is a very select group of women. Most women, especially when we're talking about not taking an oral medication, applying in the vagina, most women, it would be fine and they should, it would, it would be very well tolerated. If a patient could not or did not want to take estrogen, then she could take something called Osfina. This is an oral tablet for vaginal health. It is a non-hormonal, it's an estrogen-like medication. So it works on the estrogen receptor and it, what a serum does, it, it blocks certain functions of the estrogen and receptor. So if, for example, it has no influence on the breast, but it has very good influence on the vagina. So it is given as a dose of 60 milligram oral tablet. It improves again the vaginal pH, the vaginal lining, the elasticity. The side effects could be hot flashes and muscle cramps. So if a patient did not take estrogen, there's an estrogen-like medication that she could take called osfina or ospermaphene. The contraindications are very similar to those of estrogen, which is estrogen-dependent cancer or a blood clot and undiagnosed bleeding. It has also been studied and found to be safe for at least 12 months. It could be continued beyond 12 months, but we need to just make sure that we keep following the patients in that regard. A third treatment that has recently you know, caught on is something called vaginal laser treatment. And one of the lasers is this Mona Lisa laser, and it is a special carbon dioxide laser. And what it does is it helps with the vaginal tissues by stimulating the tissue to regenerate and grow back to a premenopausal state. So this is done. So let's let's go over some FAQs. Where is the procedure done? How long does the procedure take? It is done in an office setting and it is done completely under, under um, local anesthesia. There is absolutely minimal to no discomfort. Just think about a speculum exam, but the speculum is slowly, slowly coming outside. It takes about 10 minutes to perform and it does not cause any discomfort. There may be slight dryness sensation, but it's very minimal. You do not need to do anything before the procedures. After the procedure, you only thing is avoiding intercourse for about two days, but that's about it. There is nothing else you can run, you can do whatever you wanna do. And you should typically see results quite soon when most women will feel wetness immediately within about a few weeks of starting the Mona Lisa treatment. So it is done once a month or once every four to six weeks for about three treatments as the initial thing. And then it is repeated in a year. So once it is successful, how long will it last? So there are, let's look up, look at some studies. Now, there are only a few studies that have been done in this regard. So this is a 30 women study followed up to one year and 92% were satisfied with their treatment at one year after the Mona Lisa treatment. And all their symptoms, dysuria, burning, itching, dryness, and dyspareunia significantly improved. A second study, which was done by the inventor, Dr. Stefano Salvatore in Italy, was a, uh, it was a 12 uh, week follow up and they observed that 85% of women who were not sexually active resumed intercourse just after one treatment. All symptoms of GSM improved significantly and all patients had significant improvement in the quality of life and satisfaction scores. So Dr. Salvatore and I are uh, doing a study together. It's an Italian American co uh, collaborative study to further assess, assess the role of Mona Lisa in certain bladder functions.
So we did, we are uh, about to conclude or actually finished enrolling our own Mona Lisa study, and it's a randomized double blinded study. So this is a study that has never been done until now to really show the authenticity of Mona Lisa and make sure that this is not just a placebo effect. So what happens is it's a double blinded. That means the patient is randomly selected into receiving either laser or no, no laser. So she doesn't know. The procedure which is done in the laser group and the no laser group is the same. In the placebo arm, the laser is just not activated, whereas the laser arm, it is activated. So patient really does not know because I'm putting the probe in and moving it just like what I would do in the uh, placebo arm. The patient and the follow-up healthcare team is unaware of what was done during the procedure. So the, the patient does not know what was done and my colleague who sees the patient afterwards does not know what was done. So it's a blinded. I would know what was done, but I do not follow the patients and I take myself out of the study. We expect to present our six month findings very soon and then we'll present our one year findings. So for which patient is this treatment appropriate? Any woman who experiences GSM, this could be done. Is it safe for women with breast cancer? Yes, the Mona Lisa is very well suited, especially for women with breast cancer and who cannot take estrogen. Or in some women who are afraid of taking estrogen because of a strong family history of breast cancer or if they have a blood clot history and they cannot be on estrogen, they would be perfect for this. Now this is it. Is the procedure approved by the FDA for menopausal symptoms? No. The FDA recently made a statement about this and what the FDA said is that, you know what, the data is still not clear. We need to see what happens more. We need more information before we say that, yes, you can go ahead and do this CO2 laser or the carbon dioxide laser as a treatment option for GSM. That is exactly why we are doing this study. And ours is the first study to show that if in a randomized manner, we will know exactly what the outcomes are and there is no bias because the person who is doing the procedure is out of the study and the people who are involved, that means the patient and the follow-up team are blinded. They do not know what did the patient receive. The, then there are the other things such as the moisturizers and lubricants and a lot of women use this after menopause. There's nothing wrong with that. There are several moisturizers and lubricants available. So the the ones that we would recommend are the water-based are better suited for the vagina because it has similar osmolality. And moisturizers, the way they work is they rehydrate the dry uh, epithelium of the vagina and also help with the vaginal pH. So there's something called the osmolality, which, which is was defined by the WHO and certain additives that could cause a reaction such as the parabens, the glycols, and the antiseptics should be avoided. In some women who also have vaginal narrowing, we could use dilator treatment to dilate it or she could use something on her own to put inside the vagina. And in women who have pelvic floor tightness, we can help with the hypertonicity by doing some electrical stimulation of the vaginal muscles and vaginal relaxation therapy. Then, of course, lifestyle modifications are also important, such as weight control, smoking, improving sexual activity and yoga. From the partner standpoint, you know, it is important for the partner also to have proper health, proper erection and uh, avoid premature ejaculation and come for couples counseling. So the key consideration in, in GIST is that GSM is a very chronic condition that happens after menopause because of lack of estrogen. And if it is left untreated, it can keep worsening and worsening and sometimes then the damage may become not completely irreversible, but hard to control and revert back. Women are reluctant to talk about it. So it's up to us as healthcare providers to bring up and broach the issue and start talking to them right from their 40s and tell them that this could happen and is going to happen after menopause. So just bring it up and we will talk about it and we'll address it at that time. So healthcare providers do not address this because they do not have proper training in this. You know, they're running around and seeing patients and, you know, their attitudes and belief may be that sex should not be a priority for a woman in her 60s. But this is all wrong. It's entirely up to the woman. 
We need to encourage women to talk about this. We need to make them feel comfortable. And postmenopausal women, when they're seen in the clinic for whatever reason, the healthcare provider should bring this up and ask her if she has any symptoms of menopausal changes such as vaginal dryness, vaginal discomfort, pain during intercourse, and the topic of intimacy should always be brought up. We need to overcome our misconceptions and women need to get reliable information. In choosing therapy, the woman's preference should also be taken into consideration. There's a lot of stigma around estrogen. You know, many women fear it because of the WHI study, but now there are more studies coming out and they should fully understand that every woman has a different risk factors. So most women can tolerate vaginal estrogen very well without any concerns. So please remember the take home messages. One, genitourinary syndrome of menopause is an event that's going to happen in any woman who lives in her 50s and beyond. Most women today are living up to 90. So more than half almost of a woman's life is lived in the postmenopausal years. Also, most postmenopausal women are active and sexually active, and they would like to be sexually active in their 70s. And sometimes I have patients even in their 80s who are sexually active. It is their choice. It is for us as healthcare providers to respect their choice, to talk about these symptoms way in advance, right in their 40s, bring it up so that we can keep addressing it. And any time and every time a healthcare provider sees a postmenopausal woman, we should bring it up and keep an open discussion, explain